Well, it's not a threat. It's a natural course of the development. China is already number two in GDP, and probably within the matter of the uh, next 10 years or so, Chinese GDP would exceed that of the United States. Uh, so that, uh, you know, China and eventually India would become the two big economic giants in the world. And we have to accept that reality. You know, United States has been reading the world economy, you know, after the World War II. But now, you know, a major player is slowly changing, you know, toward China and India and uh, uh, some other Asian countries. So it is the phenomenon called reorient, reorienting uh, the center of their economic activities toward Asia. My name is Eiske Sakakibala. I'm now professor of uh, economics at Aoyama Gakuin University. And I think uh, what uh, has been called economics has had uh, quite a success, particularly uh, easy monetary policy has had uh, a major impact on the Japanese economy. It depreciated the currency quite significantly and, and it raised the equity price by as much as 60%. Uh, Mr. Abe appointed uh, Mr. Kloda, uh, Haruhiko Kloda, as the governor of Bank of Japan in the March of 2013. And Kroda aggressively is a monetary policy. Now, that has resulted in favorable re result uh, for the Japanese economy. So that so far, Abenomics has succeeded, I think. Uh, their growth rate has come down uh, to on the average of 1%. The US uh, growth rate is a little bit higher, but for Europe and uh, Japan, it's about 1%. And the inflation rate is also about, about 1%. So that uh, both growth rates and inflation uh, rate has come down. And uh, I'm not, as I said, I'm not worried about it. It is a reflection of the maturity of those developed economies. And it's only natural that at a high level of uh, sort of GDP, uh, that uh, growth rate would come down to 1% and the inflation rate would come down as well. Between 1956 and 73, we had a high growth period. Average annual growth rate was 9.1 percent. Between 74 to uh, say uh, 1990, we had so-called stable growth period. Average growth rate is about 4.2 percent. But uh, in the late uh, 80s and early 90s, Japanese growth rate has uh, become quite high. Per capita GDP of Japan has exceeded that of the United States in 1887. Of course, it depends upon the exchange rates. You know? But still, uh, in the late 80s, uh, Japanese economy has become, uh, you know, uh, one of the sort, sort of top, you know, five, ten countries uh, of the developed world, and it has matured. So since 1990, uh, Japanese economy has matured, and the average uh, rate of growth, annual rate of growth, has gone down to one percent. But uh, it's only natural at the high level per capita GDP growth rate of 1% uh, is only natural. So I do not think it's a reflection of the past uh, last two decades. It is a reflection of the maturity of the Japanese economy. Well, you know, Asian crisis, we did have some problems in Thailand uh, because of the balance of payment deficit of Thailand. And it has spread toward uh, Indonesia and Korea uh, subsequently. But my view is that the International Monetary Fund particularly a uh, deputy director of Asian department by the name of Bijan Agebele, has really failed uh, to sort of manage the Asian uh, sort of crisis at that moment. So many of the crises which followed Thailand was a result of the failure of International Monetary Fund to cope with the crisis. Uh, that is somewhat different view from the orthodoxy in the United States. But uh, people like uh, Professor Stiglitz, uh, Joe Stiglitz, agrees with me that it was a mismanagement of the IMF uh, of the crisis. So it could have been alleviated. Uh, you know, uh, it is true that Thailand did suffer from balance of payments crisis. But uh, with the right policies from, uh, you know, the IMF and the international community, uh, we could have avoided the worsening of uh, the crisis uh, toward Indonesia and, uh, and uh, Korea. Take, for example, IMF at that time suggested to move from the fixed rate to flexible exchange rate. 
But if you move to the flexible exchange rate at the time of the crisis, what happens is uh, you know, dramatic fall of the exchange rate. That is what they have done. And they have closed some of the financial institutions. Again, at the time of crisis, closing the financial institutions will result in fi major financial crisis. So that uh, my view is a substantial part of the Asian crisis is because of the mismanagement of the policies of the IMF, particularly the Asian department of the IMF uh, at that time. But from the 1990s, both China and India has moved from the planned economy to the market economy. And China and India has started to grow at a very high rate of around 7%. And I think it would continue for some time to come. You know, Japan and Korea has already matured. So that the growth rate for Japan and Korea would be between 1% and 1.5%. But the China and India would probably continue to grow at 6 7% for some time to come. Uh, so that uh, eventually, by 2050, uh, China and India would become the two major economic powers in the world. I think it's only natural that uh, you know, China and India would continue to grow at a high level and eventually succeeded by Arab nations and African countries because their sort of absolute level is still low and they have a potential to grow if they manage their economy skillfully. So that I think uh, second half of 21st century could become the century for African countries. You know, one sort of phenomenon which is taking place, you know, in Asia and uh, in uh, some countries in Africa is that the state plays a fairly crucial role in the development. So state-led uh, sort of uh, growth model may be the dominant model you know, uh, in the years to come, particularly in African countries. Uh, well, you know, uh, something else could happen, but, uh, you know, uh, they have moved to the market economy, but still uh, the importance of the state uh, is quite crucial uh, for those countries, I think. Originally, the, our basic, uh, basic sort of textbook was economics by Paul Samuelson. And uh, Paul Samuelson's book is, is translated. And uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, right now many Japanese writers write the textbooks. But uh, I could say that it originated from the American economics, or uh, Paul Samuelson, or you know, uh, those American you know, uh, economist uh, sort of uh, paradigm. And uh, it has not really that changed. Of course, we have added some uh, sort of uh, papers and salts, <laughs> but uh, uh, it has become somewhat uh, Japanese. But still, basis is the American economics, a uh, modern American economics. Well, Macroeconomics has played an uh, important role in the past and still uh, continue to play that kind of role. But microeconomic aspect has become increasingly important. You have to really look at the structure of the economy and how the structure is changing, how the micro sort of aspect of the economy is developing. Uh, since uh, I think 21st century is the century where the major structural transformation are taking place, so that appropriateness of past macroeconomics uh, may have declined somewhat. We need new sort of uh, uh, methodology uh, to analyze uh, the emerging economies. You know.